Welcome to an Introduction to Speech Act Theory. I'm Peter Vogt, and for the next several minutes, we'll be looking at Speech Act Theory, a branch of linguistics, and consider what it is and how it's relevant for us as we think about biblical interpretation. We'll start with addressing the question, what is Speech Act Theory? Speech Act Theory is based on communication examining how people communicate, and recognizing that there's more to communication than simply information transfer. Speech Act theory is marked by the recognition that words often do things besides simply inform or convey information. Some examples of Speech Act theory from everyday life, as well as from biblical texts, would include such things as the performance of a wedding. In a wedding ceremony, when the officiant says, I now pronounce you husband and wife, they're not communicating information to the, the new couple. They're instead changing their situation. When the pastor says, I now pronounce you husband and wife, they are, at least in the eyes of the church and the eyes of God, husband and wife at that time. And of course, it matters who says those things. It has to be the right context, and so Speech Act Theory also considers the context in which something is, an utterance is made in order to properly interpret it. A second example of Speech Acts might be in the form of blessing. We find in Scripture, may the Lord bless you and keep you, the ironic blessing of, of Numbers chapter 6. And it's readily recognizable that in Numbers chapter 6, the author is not simply trying to convey information. The very words would point against that. In some, it doesn't say the Lord is blessing you or the Lord will bless you, but rather it says, may the Lord bless you and, and keep you. And there it's expressing a desire that something might happen. But more than that, the speaker is also not just expressing the desire, but seeking to bring about some kind of transformation in the recipient. That is, when someone gives a blessing, they're doing it in order to, to bring about positive feelings on the part of the recipient and to actually do something in that, not simply to communicate information. Another example of a speech act would be declarations of faith. We think, for example, the statement, Jesus is Lord. And while at first glance this might seem like an example of information transfer, it obviously is a fact that Jesus is Lord, we, we accept that, but there's also something more going on than simply a, a statement of fact. Because many times, even today, when we say Jesus is Lord, we recognize that the world doesn't look like Jesus is Lord. The world is in oftentimes open rebellion to the idea of Jesus' lordship. And so to make a declaration that says Jesus is Lord is not just to communicate a truth, it is true that Jesus is Lord, but it's also to make a statement of faith. It's bolstering the faith of both the speaker, perhaps, and also the listener. It might be persuasive to try to persuade someone to accept the fact that Jesus is Lord, even in the face of a situation where it doesn't really look like Jesus is Lord. And these are all examples of speech acts, where something more is going on than simply information transfer. One writer, Kevin Van Hooser, makes the argument that that says that interpretation is the process of inferring authorial intentions and of ascribing illocutionary acts. Now, we're going to define illocutionary acts here in just a few minutes, but I want to just point out here the relationship between authorial intention, illocutionary acts, and interpretation that Van Hooser is positing here. You hopefully are aware of the idea that authorial intention is an important aspect of uh, interpretation. That is where meaning lies, is in the author's intended meaning. But what Van Hooser is saying is that part of that uh, interpretation is to understand what's actually going on with the words that are being spoken in those instances where there is a discrepancy or a disconnect between the words spoken and their appearance and what's actually happening with them. And we're going to look at that in a minute, but I want to highlight that, that that's an important consideration when we think about speech act theory. Speech act theory is very closely associated with two landmark works. The first is called How to Do Things with Words by J.L. Austin, and that really set the stage for speech act theory. 
but it was advanced very significantly by the second work, Speech Acts, an essay in the philosophy of language by John Searle. And Searle built on the work of Austin and really refined and nuanced the ideas that Austin was raising about what speech acts are and how they function and how they're helpful to us in understanding a communicative event. Searle maintains that there are three components of a speech act. We have the locution, and we'll define these terms in more detail in a minute, but that's what's said. There is the illocution, what's actually meant by those things, and then there's the perlocution, which is how a, a listener responds. So the locution is what is actually said by a speaker. And it's important to note that the locution can take any number of forms. There can be statements, questions, all sorts of grammatical uh, variations in terms of what is, being, what is being said. So these are the words that are spoken. Illocution, though, is what is verbally accomplished by what is said. Maybe a way of thinking of this is to note that the illocution is what the locution really is. That is, it's, it's doing something perhaps different from what, it, uh, from what it appears. And this is really the heart of speech act theory, the idea that there's an illocutionary effect or there's an illocution as opposed to the locution, or at least potentially opposed to the locution. Now, there are several types of illocutions, and depending on which commentator you look at, they can be characterized differently, but we'll take a look at these uh, five types of illocutions as associated with uh, John Searle's work. The first is an assertive, and an assertive is a, simply a, a statement about how things are. This might be a a, an information transfer kind of an utterance. Utterance, by the way, is a speech act term for, for type of speech. And we'll be talking about utterances as written text as well. And that certainly works in terms of this because the, the, same, the same principles apply even to written texts. But an assertive as a type of illocution is a, a statement as to how things are, the way things are. And that might be in the form of information transfer. The second type of illocution is a what's known as a directive. And in a directive, the speaker is trying to get someone to do something else. And that might be through the giving of commands, through persuasive speech, invitations, any number of things. But the idea is that they're trying to, the speaker is trying to get the listener to do something, to, to do something that they want them to do. And then we have commissives. Uh, we, in commissives, we the speaker commits themselves to, to doing something and uh, does so in by that utterance. I promise to do this is a, a commissive. It's not simply about information transfer. It's actually doing something that is committing someone to something. And then we have expressives. Expressives uh, are utterances in which the speaker expresses feelings and attitudes shares what that uh, what the feelings and attitudes might be. And then there are declarations. And these are the kinds of utterances that actually bring about changes through the, through the utterances. Um, and we already saw the example of the wedding. I now pronounce you husband and wife. That's a declarative type of uh, illocution where the reality has changed simply because of that declaration, where there was previously no married couple, Following that declaration, there is a married couple. And that's an example of a, a declarative or a declaration. Now, the third component of, uh, of a speech act is what's known as the perlocution, what the hearer does in response to the utterance. What the hearer does in response to the utterance. Now, there's a fourth category called perlocutionary intention that is not always included in the components of speech act theory. Scholars investigating speech act theory are divided as to whether or not perlocutionary intention should really be considered a part of it. I think it should be, and the reason for that is because perlocutionary intention refers to what a speaker intends for the listener to do in response to the utterance. That is, when a speaker speaks or a writer writes, they have a certain desired response. 
they're not just, uh, if we're not thinking of just information transfer, they're, they're trying to do something, and they have a desired response on the part of the listener. And that desired response certainly shapes the way in which the utterance is, is shaped in ways that we'll see here shortly. And so what a speaker intends for the listener to do in response to the utterance, I think, is a legitimate part of an examination of the entire speech act. I think it can be helpful for us to take a look at an example. We'll look at a, a couple of examples, uh, some from everyday use and some from the Bible. We're going to start with some everyday examples because I think it's helpful to us to, to recognize that this goes on all the time. We're whether you've ever heard of speech act theory or not, you, you have a grasp of how it works because you're able to function uh, effectively in everyday society. We're surrounded by speech acts, and we use speech acts consistently and, and frequently in our lives. So we're going to look at a couple of examples that are non-biblical, and then we'll look at a biblical example that I think will help us to understand better what's going on in, with speech acts. Prior to my starting seminary, I served for four years as an officer on a destroyer. And it would not be uncommon during my day when we were at sea for me to hear over the loudspeaker the announcement being uh, spoken, Lieutenant Vote, please dial 613. Now, after a very short time on the ship, I, I learned that 613 was the number for the captain of the ship, the commanding officer. And so, as a good, obedient naval officer, when I heard that uh, announcement being made, please dial 613, I would dutifully call that number and my captain would answer the phone. My captain might say then to me, Lieutenant Vogt, would you please come to my stateroom? Again, as a, a good naval officer, my response to his utterance would be to say, aye, aye, captain. Now, we can all understand, even if you haven't been in the military, why this is uh, what we would expect. The utterance, Lieutenant Vote, would you please come to my stateroom? The response, aye, aye, Captain. It makes sense under the circumstances. But let's look at a possible other response that I might have given and why that does or doesn't work. In response to the question, Lieutenant Vote, would you please come to my stateroom? It would be inappropriate if I were to respond and say, no thanks, Captain, I'm a bit busy right now. But why is that an inappropriate response? After all, the utterance is an invitation. Would you please come to my stateroom? Uh, and if it's an invitation, then my response, no thanks, Captain, I'm a bit busy right now, would be an appropriate response. But we can all presumably understand just at a gut level that this is not an appropriate response in this situation, and certainly not one that I would, uh, would have wanted to try. So let's take a look from the standpoint of speech act theory and see if we can understand why this would be an inappropriate response and what's actually going on in the communicative uh, endeavor between my captain and me. When we take a look at this from a, a speech act theory, we note that the locution is what is actually said by a speaker. This is the utterance that my captain made. Lieutenant Vote, would you please come to my stateroom? Now the locution, as we encounter it, is in the form of a question. We recognize that by the question mark at the end, which would suggest that this is a request or an invitation. And as we said, that's what it appears to be. That's the locution, what is actually said by a speaker. But illocution, as we've already noted, is what is verbally accomplished by what is said. What is this utterance actually doing? It's not actually asking a question. It looks like it's a request or an invitation. But we recognize that what's really happening is that my captain is giving me an order. So the, the illocution or the illocutionary effect of the utterance is that he's given me an order. He could have said, Lieutenant Vote, come to my stateroom. And in that instance, the locution and the illocution would match. But he chooses, for whatever reasons uh, he does, he chooses to say the, the order in the form of a question. That is, the locution is in a request or an invitation form, but the illocution is that it's an order. Now, some of this depends on context, because it's an axiom in the military that a request from a senior officer is tantamount to an order. And so I knew that going into my experience on the ship. He knew that going into the to his uh, experience on the ship. So that's a shared context that we both have and that we bring to the communicative situation. And therefore, 
I understand that the illocutionary effect of his utterance is not a request, it's not an invitation, it's in fact an order. And so this is what's actually going on there and why we can understand at an intuitive level that my response of, no thanks, Captain, I'm a bit busy right now, is inappropriate. It's not just having to do with the fact that... Uh, that he's a captain in that, although that's that's the context for it. But from a theoretical standpoint, we understand that that in that um, response, what I have done is I have misunderstood the illocution. And the in speech act theory, there's an actual term for this called an infelicitous speech act, an unhappy speech act. But we don't need to worry about that terminology exactly, although I would imagine I'd be fairly unhappy if I had responded that way. But a felicitous speech act, a happy speech act, is one in which the listener understands the illocution. Now, the perlocution is what the hearer does in response to the utterance. And in this instance, my response is to say, aye, aye, captain, and presumably to then actually go to the, uh, go to the stateroom where my captain is. But that's the, what the hearer does in response to the utterance is the perlocution. We mentioned the fourth aspect of speech act theory, that is perlocutionary intention. What a speaker intends for the listener to do in response to the utterance. And in this situation, what the speaker, my captain, intends for the listener to do is to say, aye, aye, and actually come. And this is where that bringing perlocutionary intention, I think, is a, a helpful contribution to speech act theory because it reminds us that when my captain says, Lieutenant Vote, would you please come to my stateroom? He has an interest in the response. He's not just throwing a request out there, throwing information out there, doing something like that. He actually has something that he wants me to do in response. Now, we can see how this works further by looking at another uh, example or, or perhaps shifting the example slightly. When I was on the ship, I had working for me a chief petty officer. And a chief petty officer in the Navy is the equivalent of a sergeant in the other, in the other services. And the, the chief petty officer worked for me, and the chiefs on the ship would live together in a, uh, an area of the ship known as the chief's mess. It had nothing to do with how they kept it, their state of cleanliness, that's just what it's called. Now, it would also not be uncommon for me in my day to encounter a situation where my chief petty officer that worked for me would call me up and he would say, Lieutenant Vogt, would you please come to the chief's mess? Now, in response to that utterance, I might say to my chief, no thanks, chief, I'm a bit busy right now. Now, the question is, is this a legitimate response? And we can all presumably recognize that this would be a legitimate response to the utterance there. Now, why is it a legitimate response? Because in this instance, the locution is in the form of an invitation or a request, and that's also the illocutionary effect. That's also the illocution, is a request or an invitation. Why? Because my chief is not higher in rank than I am. And, and so it's not the case that a request from a, a, junior, uh, a junior person is tantamount to an order. That only works the other way around. The request from a senior is tantamount to an order. So because I outranked my chief, the, the nature of the communication situation is such that his illocution matches the locution, and he requests that I would come to the chief's mess. And I might then respond, no thanks, chief, I'm a bit busy right now. So when we think of the, the different types of illocutions that we talked about before, we see that what we're dealing with here are directives. In, in both examples, whether it's the captain speaking or the chief speaking, the purpose of the speech is to get the listener to do something. Now, in the case of the captain, the, the directive is much stronger than in the case of the chief. In the case of the chief, it's a request. It's an invitation. In the case of the captain, it's an order. But either way, it's a directive, and it's trying to get the listener to do something different. We can see that it's not a, an assertive. It's not saying the way things are. Um, it's not a commissive where the speaker is committing themselves to do something, I might make a, a commissive and say, um, if I say to my chief, uh, no thanks, chief, I'm a bit busy right now, but I'll be there at, uh, at five o'clock, then that would be a commissive. I've committed myself to something at that point. But the utterances as we've currently seen them are directives, not commissives. We can see they're not expressives, and we can see that they're not 
declarations either, according to the definitions we've given. So let's take another, another example, a non-biblical example. Now when we look at the statement, it's cold outside, I hope we can see that this can actually function in at least four different ways, and maybe you can think of other ways that it could be, that it could be functioning. It could function as an assertive, simply a statement of how things are. I might walk in from, from the cold, and I might say to someone, it's cold outside, and I'm simply telling them the way that it, the way that it is. Um, it might be a response to a question. How cold is it? It's cold outside. And that's simply a, an assertive, telling someone the way that it is. It could also function as a directive. I have uh, several children, and when I'm helping them get ready for school, one of them might say to me, can I wear my light jacket? I might respond and say, it's cold outside. Now, on the surface of it, and if we were looking at a transcript, we might say, well, he didn't answer the question. He just simply told them that it's cold outside. But in reality, what I'm doing in the communicative situation there, here again, based on positional authority, I'm actually giving a directive. When they're asking, can I wear my light jacket? And I respond and say, it's cold outside. They understand, or at least I hope they understand, that what I'm saying is I'm telling them not to wear the light jacket, but that they have to wear a heavier jacket. But that, so the utterance looks like it's simply a statement, but it's actually a directive. Things can function in, in different ways, as we've noted. Uh, it could be a commissive, where, where the speaker commits themselves to doing something. If I'm going outside to do something, and perhaps my wife is uh, interested in, in me coming in quickly because we have things that we have to accomplish there, and she might say, well, don't take, don't take too long outside. I might respond and say, it's cold outside indicating that I have no intention of, of being very long outside. I'm committing myself to uh, coming in in a reasonable time. So the utterance, it's cold outside, actually then is a, a commissive. Finally, uh, the same expression, it's cold outside, could be an expressive, where we express our feelings and attitudes in, in terms of a situation. So if I'm uh, in the midst of a, a cold Minnesota winter, and it's been below zero for several days, and I'm fed up with it, and I'm, I'm tired of it, I might just say, it's cold outside. And I'm, I'm not trying to convey information. I'm trying to communicate my feelings, that I'm unhappy about the fact that it's cold outside. The one type of, of utterance that this, or elocution this probably isn't, is a declarative. That is, reality isn't affected by this utterance. My saying it's cold outside doesn't make it cold outside. And if there were some type of utterance where that were the case, then that would then be a declarative. But this is not a, an example of that. Uh, I'm not God, and so therefore my declaration, my statement, my utterance that it's cold outside doesn't make it cold outside. Let's take a look then at a biblical example. We have in Deuteronomy 6.4 the utterance, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. Now, on the surface of it, it might seem like this is simply a statement of fact or, or a, uh, an assertive. The author might be asserting that Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. But we have to dig a little bit deeper to understand the illocutionary effect of this particular utterance. Certainly its appearance is that of an assertive, but is it an assertive? That's the question that we have to wrestle with. It's also the question that we uh, heard from Van Hooser that's central to interpretation. So let's think about this a little bit further. The context of this comes in the book of Deuteronomy, which is a collection of the speeches of Moses. And if you accept Deuteronomy's treatment that uh, Moses is the author of Deuteronomy, which seems to be backed up by other texts in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, uh, then we can consider the context in which this statement was made. I do think Moses is the author of Deuteronomy, and as such, I think that he uttered the words in Deuteronomy on the plains of Moab to the generation of Israelites that were gathered there. Now, that generation of Israelites gathered on the plains of Moab was actually the second generation of Israelites that came out of Egypt and, and had experienced the Exodus. The first generation, as you probably recall, died out uh, in the wilderness, and the second generation was now at the plains of Moab, what I call the back door to the promised land, and are on the verge of taking the land. Moses, of course, is not going to go into the promised land. His rebellion at uh, Kadesh Barnea uh, 
um, caused God to say that he would not enter the land, and therefore um, he would have to stay behind. So Deuteronomy and the speeches that are present there represent Moses' last best chance to tell the Israelites what they need to know in order to successfully be the people of God in the land. Now, going into the land, the Israelites were going to find themselves in a situation where the statement, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone, is not as easy to swallow as it first appears. And it's not the case that the Israelites would readily find themselves um, seeing evidence of the fact that Yahweh is the one true God. Because the Israelites lived in the ancient Near Eastern world where many gods were thought to exist and many gods were believed in by the people around them. One thing that the Israelites were precluded from was simply accepting the existence of other gods. That was certainly open to the devotees of ancient Near Eastern gods, where they might accept the existence of other gods, but still believe in the primacy of their god. So we have this motley-looking cast of characters here that represent images of ancient Near Eastern gods. And so if one were a follower of, say, Marduk, the god of the Babylonians, he's the, the sort of dog or dragon-like creature up at the, the top, slightly off to the right there, he was the god of the Babylonians, and a Babylonian would presumably have believed that Marduk was the, the greatest of all the gods, that he was the chief, the chief god. But they would have accepted the existence of other gods. And so when a Babylonian came in contact with, say, a Canaanite, and for whom the chief god was Baal, and Baal is the figure in the middle with the sort of pointy head, kind of looks like a cone head there. Um, but the, the Canaanites believed that Baal was the chief god. And when a Babylonian came in contact with the Canaanites, uh, they would perhaps differ on the question of which god was the chief god, but they would agree on the existence of their gods. Now, this is precisely the, the course of action that's forbidden for the Israelites. Because part of what Moses is doing in Deuteronomy, not just in Deuteronomy 6.4, but also earlier in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 39, it says, um, Yahweh is God, there is no other. And so for the Israelites, it's not just the case that Yahweh is the, the most important God for them. He is the one true God, and he is the only God that exists. And so the Israelites in, in Deuteronomy are being asked to not just accept the fact that Yahweh is the only God for the Israelites as simply a, a point of information. Moses isn't saying this with the idea that the Israelites listening and, and taking notes would just jot that factoid down. Uh, but rather, Moses is saying this to the Israelites with the idea that they not only recognize the truth of the statement, but that they commit themselves to the truth of that statement, which means believing in Yahweh, trusting in Yahweh, and living differently. And in fact, the rest of Deuteronomy, not just the Shema that follows this, but, uh, but also the rest of Deuteronomy, outlines how it is that the Israelites are to live out the supremacy of Yahweh as the one true God, not just for the Israelites, but the one true God that exists. So as we interpret Deuteronomy, we ask about the illocutionary effect, the question that Van Hooser raised for us, we, we have to consider the fact that this utterance is more than just about information transfer. It's a directive kind of, uh, kind of utterance where people are being asked to, uh, to do something different, to commit themselves to God and to live accordingly. In some ways, it's a bit like that utterance, Jesus is Lord, that we talked about before, where the, the reality on the ground is not uh, reflective of the fact that Yahweh is the one true God, or at least to the Israelites' eyes, it doesn't seem like that. So they're being asked to make that statement of faith, that commitment, and then to live accordingly, to put their trust in God, putting aside all other gods, putting aside any hope that the other gods might also be gods for the Israelites, and instead commit themselves to Yahweh alone. And that utterance is a directive utterance, and the illocution is different from the locution, as we've seen. Now, what does this do for us in terms of communicating this text? What does it matter to think about the illocution? I think it's an important question to consider, because as we want to communicate the meaning of the text, as we try to bring the the vibrancy of the 
text in its original setting to a contemporary audience, it's important, I think, that we recognize exactly what the author is trying to do. The perlocutionary intention of Moses in writing Deuteronomy 6.4 is not to give the Israelites facts. Rather, the perlocutionary intention is to get them to live differently. And when we communicate a text like Deuteronomy 6.4, and hopefully we'll communicate it in context as well of the passage that comes after it as well as before it, but when we try to communicate the meaning of the text like Deuteronomy 6.4, I think it's most effective when we try to uh, take something of the communicative, uh, the communicative intention of the author and bring that to bear to our communicative endeavors even in this contemporary situation. And that, I think, is where speech act theory can be very helpful to us in understanding the relevance of the text for today.